Your former doctoral student and assistant, Kelly Demers, agrees that your most significant professional accomplishment is the work you have done around social justice and teacher education. Tell us about teaching for social justice in the context of teacher preparation and also the discourse of race in the curriculum. Well, we've been talking. I think we've mm -hmm. been talking about that quite a bit. It's interesting that Kelly talks about that because her dissertation was on this topic as well, and it sort of grew out of this um, mutual interest and work that we did together. Um, her, if, if it's okay to mention, talk about her work a, a little bit, she was really interested in how issues of race play out in the work of teachers, particularly sure. white teachers, who have classes that are almost entirely students of color. And so her dissertation looked at two white teachers over a long period of time with uh, uh, successive interviews and conversations over time that really went back to people's um, autobiographical experiences, their ideologies, the discourses they had grown up in. And how, how, does, this, how does this play out in your day-to-day -day work, in the opportunities you give students, and so on? It was a very nice piece of work um, that I think uncovered uh, aspects of these issues that we don't that we don't think about all now, the time. So this is Unlearning Racism. Is this what the, the, where the title came from, Unlearning Racism? Mm, I don't know. What is that the title of? I uh, think I wrote a, Unlearn Racism is what she wrote. Well, I have an article with that title. I can't remember okay. if she used it in her dissertation or, or not. Uh, just that your work about, about unlearning how to racism. unlearn racism. Yeah. Yes. Um, the idea with unlearning racism is really that all of us who grow, have grown up in a racist society, which mm -hmm. is all of us, mm -hmm. um, have... Uh, incorporated and internalized racist ideas, whether we like it or not, whether we think we're uh, racist or not, and so on. And that as teacher educators, we, and teachers, we have to work really hard and all the time to be unlearning those kinds of things. Sure. And so unlearning is sort of recognizing, digging deeper, questioning, um, and really uh, owning the fact that we make mistakes, that we, that we think we have learned particular kinds of lessons about race, but then it may turn out that we really haven't. I mean, part of the unlearning racism idea was, um, for me, was realizing that growing up the way I did, I had some insights about gender and about um, class in terms of working class and middle and upper class because of my own experience growing sure. up. And I had some insights there. But as a person who grew up in the privileged racial group, and not to mention a lot of other things about you know our multiple identities, there were aspects of race that even though I like to think I'm a pretty liberal mm -hmm. you know, person who has these uh, progressive kinds of commitments, that there were times when I just didn't get it and made mistakes, and, and I've written about some of those things under this concept of unlearning racism. It's a hard, it's a hard thing it's to continuous. admit. It's continuous. And it's continuous, mm -hmm. yeah. So what are your current thoughts about the current critiques of teacher education? Well, that question, we could certainly be here all night. Mm -hmm. um, teacher education has been critiqued forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's probably one of the most enduring aspects of its history. I think along the way, some of those critiques are legitimate. I think some of them aren't. Um, and I think we are in a time now, I, I really believe teacher education at colleges and universities in 2013 is at a crossroads. And I think it's possible that in the next 10, 15 years, we, we won't have the kind of teacher preparation programs very much that we have now. Okay, so we've, we've gone through this before in the 80s, and so now yeah. you're thinking that this might be the one that's really going to make some serious changes. Uh, yes, but some serious changes that might mean just fewer and fewer okay. Okay. college and university-based teacher preparation programs. I mean, I think the, uh, a lot of the... There are certainly very, very legitimate criticisms of teacher preparation programs. 
And I think that's probably true of professional preparation in lots of areas. There are legitimate criticisms. What do you think those legitimate criticisms are? Well, I think in, in some places there isn't, hasn't been enough of an emphasis on uh, closely supervised uh, experiences in the schools okay. where people are placed with really good, strong teachers as role models and where they have an opportunity to ask questions and try out things. And mm -hmm. you know, So I think a legitimate criticism is that some programs have not focused enough on that. Sure. Um, some people say now that one of the criticisms is that we focus too much on beliefs, even, even knowledge and not enough on action. Mm. I think that's probably a very unfortunate dichotomy. I think if we only focus on beliefs and never focus on what do beliefs have to do with practice and with action, then, then it's a problem. Mm -hmm. But I think we can't ignore beliefs. I right. think beliefs matter a lot in um, what people do. Susan Lytle and I have talked about um, practice isn't just what people do in classrooms or how, when, and where they do it. It's about how they think about what they do. Sure. How do they make decisions? What do they see as problematic? What are the interpretive frames they use to make sense of what's going on? So all of that has a lot to do with beliefs and frameworks and perceptions. So I think that criticism that we focus too much on beliefs can be true, but it's only true if you really understand it in this more complex way. So I think, I think that's, uh, that's part of it. So, and there are, there are lots of other criticisms. I mean, I think it's certainly true that some people would suggest that teacher education would be better if we had stronger teacher candidates. Well, sure. I don't know any program that's saying, oh, let's not take the strongest ones. Let's, let's go for the weaker ones. Yeah. You know? People are taking the strongest candidates who apply who for, apply for their the particular sure. programs. And why can't we be like other countries, some other countries sure. who, that do so well in the international comparisons and where teaching is one of the most um, popular uh, uh, professions that people want to go into. In Korea, I think it's teaching is um, like in the top 5% of what people want to do. Finland, Finland. All, you know, all these yeah. countries that all are... All these examples of all yeah. the top, top international Why don't we scores. do that? Yes. Well, you know, it's a, it's a complicated thing. We, we have all this media bashing of teachers. Mm -hmm. We have real and not real criticism, so legitimate and not so legitimate criticisms. I think we hold teachers and teacher educators accountable for a great deal of what's wrong with the schools. We tend to act like it is school factors that make the difference. Sure. So we do all these things that make teaching not a very attractive career, and then we wonder why we're not necessarily getting the strongest people who are interested in teaching. So I think, you know, we look with envy at Finland and Korea and Singapore and places that do so well, but you, you can't just make a direct translation. So mm -hmm. we would have to change a lot of the culture and put much more of an emphasis on professionalism. Uh, morale in teaching is very low these days, uh, according to surveys and everywhere. Yes. Everywhere, right? That's, in this country, that's one, yes, yeah. that's one. That's consistent research finding consistent. across studies. So. Uh, and then we wonder why people aren't so, you know, chomping at the bit to go into that career where morale is so very low. So where I, teachers themselves are telling their own children, don't you do don't what want I to do. Teach. Exactly, right. which is the new right. phenomenon right. that we didn't have in the, That's even right. my generation. So un until we start, I think, to look at larger factors about why we have enduring achievement gaps and why we have enduring inequities in outcomes and opportunities, that include teachers, but don't stop at teachers. You know, school factors matter. Teachers matter, perhaps, the most in, among school factors. But there are all these other, you know this very well from your own work and the work of your mentor, you know, poverty matters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the kinds of services that are available to people. Housing, transportation, jobs, all those things matter. So I think if we continue to just act as if, if we, hold teachers and teacher education more and more accountable, it will fix everything. I don't think that's so likely to happen. 
What are your thoughts about the current um, push towards alternative certification programs? Well, one thing that is good, I think, is that in the research we have, I think, gotten beyond what I and some others have referred to as the horse race approach. You know, we'll do these studies that will compare traditional programs mm -hmm. and alternate programs, and we'll see which one gets there first and which one's better. I, and, and those studies went on for a pretty long time, sure. even though a lot of work had been done making the argument that those two categories are not useful, mm -hmm. that there's more variation within this category of traditional or alternate, maybe then between. These just aren't useful categories, but people continue to use them. Um, so I think we are somewhat beyond that now. And I, in the research that I have seen lately, in the last three, four years, I think people are trying to really um, have a much more nuanced view sure. of what's effective. So what are the ingredients within teacher preparation of any kind? Across the board. Based sure. on any entry pathway. Sure. What are the, th the aspects that seem, to have, um, that seem to have an impact on students' learning, that seem to have an impact on retention of teachers, that seem to have an impact on the quality of practice? So I think that's a good thing. I think there are some alternate, alternate, you know, I'm using the term as if it's mm -hmm. one thing, but I think there are some programs that have <clears throat> a number of good aspects. So I think there are multiple ways to enter teaching that can be good. The thing that I think is very bad is what seems to be this sort of new normal where what we do is we have this revolving door of new teachers into especially schools that are under-resourced with large numbers of kids who are low income and minority. And we have this revolving group of new teachers who come in and stay a, a short amount of time as if that's, that's sort of our system for, mm -hmm. for those kids and for those teachers. I think that's goes back to social justice. Unsustainable. It's right. never yes. Right. It's never It's what those kids deserve. Yeah. Well is it really? But that's what they're getting. Yeah, that's what they're getting. Exactly. Year after year after year. Yeah. Meanwhile, kids who are in more affluent school districts, they have teachers who are well prepared and who have good subject matter degrees and they're smart and they stay. Mm. A while. Now that's a stark sure, comparison. Right, it's right. not entirely true, but I think the fact that we're sort of moving into this arrangement is, is a real problem. Mm. Tell us about the national agenda in teacher education reform. That was published in the early 2000s, 2000, 2001 or so. And what we tried to do there was to um, at the time, look at these two big agendas for the reform of teacher preparation, professionalization and deregulation. So this was at the time when more and more alternate routes were on the horizon and there was a really big debate about, and, and it was even, even prior to the horse race studies, you know, this was when the, it was mostly this um, debate in the media or this mm -hmm. de the actual physical debates uh, between advocates of these approaches. What we tried to do in that Stick, Stones, and Ideology article was say, well, let's look at how these two agendas actually make their arguments, um, looking at similar aspects uh, of, like, what did they say about evidence and documentation uh, and accountability, and what kind of argument were they trying to make? So what we were really trying to do was unpack the arguments on the two sides. And we were trying to be as objective as possible. Now that's, and we said that in the, in the piece. Of course, both of us were teacher educators at universities. So we weren't objective about alternate routes or deregulation at the time, um, where the idea, which is, is really what we have, have in place now to a, to a certain extent, um, all sorts of programs that are uh, deemed effective or not based on uh, this relentless focus on outcomes in the form of test scores. Mm -hmm. um, so we were trying to unpack all that and then raise questions. The, the stick stones and ideology idea was that 
part of what we found was true on both sides of that argument was that people use the word ideology as a kind of epithet. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, you hear this in politics mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. So somebody will say, well, that's just an ideological argument. Or, and Obama will say this. We need to get beyond ideology. Yeah, ideology right. We were trying to make the argument that ideology is not in and of itself a bad thing. Ideology has to do with beliefs and values. And, and um, it's not like an ideologue where it's a closed system and you never want to hear anything except your own beliefs, but that this was one of the strategies, one of the rhetorical strategies that was being used on both sides of the argument. So we try to do that kind of thing in the, um, in the article in a sense, um, not quite demystifying, but certainly um, unpacking and scrutinizing what these arguments were at the time and really connecting particular kinds of arguments with professionalization and with deregulation. So that's what that piece was doing. Okay. When you served as the editor of the Journal of Teacher Education from 2000 to 2006, you illustrated how emerging practice shapes policy, but more often how policy trumps practice. Your friend and colleague Susan Lytle notes that your work here was marked by a steady stream of con concise, provocative, and elegant arguments in editorials that ultimately became a classic. How can we reverse those trends? <laughs> if I only knew. Yes. Uh, if I only knew how we could reverse those trends, and I think I could get rich and famous. Um, what she's talking about are the editorials that I wrote in Journal of Teacher Education um, in every issue for six years. So I wrote 30 editorials. Um, it was a, I, I liked doing that, I, looking back. Um, the first one I ever wrote, I realized I didn't know how to write an editorial. You know, what's an editorial? What do we really, what does that really mean uh, in an academic journal? Uh, so I think the first few were sort of uh, blood, sweat, and tears about uh, really um, learning to write in a new genre where I wanted to be scholarly in the sense that I wanted to say smart things and use sure. evidence and not just be popping off, I think, you know, this is my opinion. Uh, but, I, but it wasn't an article. It wasn't mm -hmm. an academic article. So. Uh, I forget the adjectives you used um, that she that she used, uh, but I, I I was trying to be sort of pithy and 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 crystallized. provocative provocative yes elegant oh that that I that is a really good word that's it's, a good <laughs> yeah I definitely was elegant <laughs> yes but but I mean that's I think that's what I was aiming for sure. with those editorials I couldn't have told you that at the beginning yeah. when I was first writing them but I I tried to take uh, some current issue or some new report that had just come out, which was not hard to find because there was a new report every, sure. every other month, uh, or some pending policy proposal, or uh, some contra big controversial thing, and in uh, a relatively short number of words, try to say something that would be helpful to people. It, it wasn't unlike what Kim and I were trying to do in the Stick Stones and Ideology. Sure unpack the arguments, sure. say, well, what about this, and what about this, and this assumes this, and here's the way this argument is made. Um, and I got a, a wonderful response to those. People would write to me, some people I knew and some people I didn't know, who would write to me and say, I look, f I look forward to reading this every time the new issue comes out. It really does help me understand what's going on. So. That's great, and I think we could use a lot of that. The uh, unpacking of the assumptions, yeah. especially in terms of educational policies, especially in terms of current issues right now, that is maybe that answers partly the question in terms of rebridging this um, this this link between research and policy. These assumptions that are being made mm -hmm. and the ideologies you can't dismiss them. Yeah. Um, Dudley Maring, your friend and colleague, describes your pi pioneering work on teacher research as helping to change how the field thinks about the relationship between teachers and research as well. Instead of teachers as mere implementers of research conducted at distant universities, your work with Susan Lytle, again, has repositioned teachers as producers and partners in educational research. Tell us about your work and values on practitioner inquiry. Well, 
the first piece that Susan Lytle and I wrote, which I think was published in 1990 um, in ER, was called um, Research on Teaching and Teacher Research, The Issues That Divide. And what we had been struck by was um, in reading the third handbook of research on teaching, sure. which came out in 1986, and you know, it was sort of the Bible of sure, sure. what we know about uh, research on teaching. And on the book jacket, I, we rem I remember it said, um, um, this uh, handbook contains everything we need to know about teaching and learning, or something like that. <laughs> and you know, that's a pretty big claim. <laughs> Bold. And what we were really struck by was that none of the work that was cited in all of those research reviews in that volume with the, that was over a thousand pages long, none of it referred to any work by teachers or really mm. accounted for what teachers might know. Mm. So our work at that point was, can this be right? Can it be right that this is everything we need to know? Uh, ideas and concepts and facts and knowledge developed by outside researchers. So the, so the first book that we wrote was called Inside Outside, Teacher Research and Knowledge. And we were trying to say, we, it's not going to work to fix the schools and fix teachers and fix students if we just have outside knowledge that's transported in with the assumption that it will be used in schools. We need that kind of work. It can be helpful. But we also need inside knowledge knowledge generated by people who have this on the ground, everyday, close, working relationship with students and families and communities. So we started, we're, we didn't originate this idea, but we started writing about teacher research. Um, and what kind of knowledge is it that teachers generate? And we, we were not working from the assumption that everything teachers say is knowledge. Sure or everything that um, teachers might call knowledge is knowledge. So it's not teacher beliefs are knowledge. Or, but what, what do we mean if we call it knowledge? And what do we mean if we call what people are doing research? Eventually, many years later, we wrote what we called the sequel to that first book. Now, it took 16 years to come out, so that was a long <laughs> sequel. Um, it came just out a few years ago in 2009. Inquiry of Stance. Inquiry of Stance. And we, we didn't just write about teacher research. We now refer to it as practitioner research or practitioner inquiry. Because over the years, it was clear it wasn't just teachers. It was other people who were engaged as practitioners in educational settings. So school principals, um, sure. uh, supervisors, tutors. It might be people in some other kind of educational setting. We have people who work in prisons as teachers or tutors or instructors sure. in museums. So any kind Odd. of educational setting. And we worked, talked more about practitioner research. So how do you guarantee that as, as a teacher educator? And then how do you try to instill that once people go out into the field? Well, you can't guarantee it, that's yeah. for sure. But you can try to instill try it. Try to instill it, sure. Um, so at in the teacher ed program that I ran at Penn and in our program here at Boston College, we have inquiry as a centerpiece of the work. So the idea is trying to help teacher candidates understand that um, what we call this inquiry as stance is a kind of world view on how to make sense of the shifting world of educational practice and policy and research, mm -hmm. and how do you make sense of what somebody comes in and says, this is the new best practice. This is what everybody should be doing. This is the latest thing. What, what are, what's a teacher supposed to do with that? Mm -hmm. So the idea of inquiry as stance is partly that you raise questions about it. You connect it to what you're already doing. You um, work with other people in a community to look at whatever this knowledge that is supposedly being brought in is doing. But you also raise questions about your own work. So you, you generate a question that you want to explore. And how are you going to explore it? Using data, now construed in a very broad way. So sure. data could be kids' written work. Mm -hmm. It could be conversations in the class. It could be the materials a teacher produces, the lesson plan, a handout, a test, an assignment. But all of that work is sort of the data of practice. And the idea is that practitioners come together and raise their questions and, and look at 
the data of practice and generate insights that are useful. Locally based. For the local context, but might also be useful and helpful. Sure more broadly. Sure. So that's kind of what this local knowledge, more public knowledge, we've tried to work with that concept for many years. It, it gets complicated. Some people uh, think you can't call that knowledge, you can't call that research, not with a capital K okay. or with a capital R. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had an, a lot of interesting uh, back and forths with people along those lines.